1996, Joseph Writings, a 21-year-old manager of an electronics store, was killed during an armed robbery in Knoxville, Tennessee. Three young people were involved. Amanda Jo Good and Almir Nance were both 16. Robert Manning was 20. He gave Almir a gun and they both went into the radio shack armed. Amanda waited in the car. Manning later testified that he killed the manager with a shot to the head. Even though Almir Nance didn't pull the trigger, he was convicted of felony murder and sentenced to a minimum of 51 years in prison. He's 43 years old now. I've been here through my whole 20s, 30s. I haven't, I haven't been outside the fence. When they say count time, I got to go in the room. They lock the door, I can't come out. I'm missing life. I'm missing the world. I'm missing it all. Almir actually represents so many people that were just there. And they're held accountable for things that technically they did not do. Tennessee has the longest mandatory sentence in the United States for a teenager convicted of felony murder. If they're 16 or 17, if they're carrying a gun and they know they're not supposed to have a gun and they're involved in a criminal act, they know that's wrong and you, you can't afford to let those people out. Fault lines travel to Tennessee as the state Supreme Court considers whether these 51-year sentences violate the Constitution. It's unfair. It's like they're trapped there in some sort of nightmare that they can't get out of. My daughter's grown. She's in her 20s. I've been in prison her whole life. She's never known me outside of a visitation gallery. You don't want to give him a chance to, like, become a better person for his family. 51 years before parole is ridiculous. Because what's the point? I've been in prison more years than I've been free on the street. I wasn't old enough to buy cigarettes, but I was old enough for you to throw me away forever. Should he be punished? Yes. But 51 years, what kind of justice system is that? On January 18, 1996, the day of the shooting, Robert Manning showed up to Almir's house and flashed a pistol. He said, get in the car. I need you to help me go find a way to get some money. I got to get out of town. He's a scary dude, man. What I remember most about Robert Manning is that he had no off switch. I was always struck by the fact that he seemed to have no conscience. Um, at all. He did not seem to have true remorse or regret for anything he did. And that made him incredibly dangerous. He says, hey, you remember your buddy? I shot him. Are you mad? Robert Manning had a history of violence. He had shot and injured one of Elmire's friends earlier that day. And if you don't have a problem with it, you need to get in here with me and ride with me. My son was afraid for his life and he had every right to be afraid. I had no fear. I probably would have gotten the car, too. I'm in the back seat. He got this girl with him. I don't know her. Amanda was the other teenager in the car that day. She asked us not to show her face. Do you have any memory of whether Almir wanted to come along to do this thing? I think it's the same as me. He had no idea it was going to turn out the way that it did. And I do know for a fact after that, he did tell Almir, wait right here with her. Come with me, Almir. Sit in the car with her, Almir. So you can kind of imagine maybe what the conversation was like. After the shooting, the group robbed a home nearby and tied up the couple, locking them in the trunk of their car. When he finally took me home, I went home, I prayed, I cried. I knew it was serious, big trouble. Really, really serious, big trouble. Robert Manning was pulling the strings from the get-go. He decided that they would go over the radio shack. That's his call. And that was always my sense about both those young people is, but for Robert Manning, neither of these kids would have been in this situation. The 
subject being interviewed will be a black male subject named Almir Nance. Almost a week after the shooting, Almir Nance was arrested in the middle of the night and interrogated at this Knox County Sheriff's Office building. A 16-year-old, without a parent, without my permission, without an attorney, eight or nine officers kept him in there all night long. The subject of this interview will be the uh, homicide which occurred. Almir told police that Robert Manning killed Joseph Ridings. I was nervous. I like turned around to run out the store. And when I was like at the door, I pushed the door open and I heard a shot. Almir says he repeatedly asked for a lawyer that night, but never got one. They lied to me, they manipulated me. They told me they were going to call me a lawyer. They were trying to get me help. At the end of the day, it was none of that. He's a 16-year-old kid that's been woken up at gunpoint with dogs, cut off from his mother, and he still shows the presence of mind to invoke counsel. I want a lawyer. We reviewed the trial transcripts with Chris Irwin, a former public and defender, and Imani Mfalme, an activist in Knoxville. Yeah. In court, the officer who questioned Almir testified that he didn't recall him asking to see an attorney. And the officer lied. When he was on the stand, under oath, did he invoke counsel? He said, no. No, he did not. And he comes back with his notes in hands and he goes, oh, he did invoke his right to counsel. The officer's own handwritten notes contradicted his testimony under oath, but the judge refused to throw out Almir's statements to police. What impact does that have on the rest of his case? When you have some 16-year-old talking about his involvement, he would have said anything. Constitutionally, the statement obviously should have been suppressed. It was obviously a coerced confession. I couldn't even explain to you how, how, how sorry I feel. I, I ain't expect none of that to happen, man. I really ain't know nothing about it. It was the last thing in my mind. That'll be the end of this interview with uh, Almir Nance. Initially, Robert Manning blamed the shooting on Almir, but he later testified in court that he pulled the trigger. I ended up shooting him, pushed him down away from my man. You said this is that you shot Joseph Ryan? Yeah. Robert Manning was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. While in prison, he stabbed a man and set him on fire, killing him. He did not respond to any letters from fault lines. While Amir was sentenced to a minimum of 51 years, that wasn't the case for the third person involved in the robbery, Amanda Jo Good. She did how much time in jail? 50 years, 40 years, 10 years? She did one year she was incarcerated. What's the difference between her and Amir? The person who has a darker skin color is going to get more time. That has been proven. You had a white judge, white prosecutor, white defense attorney, white cops, and then you have this black kid that's sitting there, 16 when it happened, and gets nailed. The color of his skin was not my concern, uh, and never was. I Randy Nichols was the district attorney at the time and oversaw the prosecution of Almir's case. Don't you see a double standard in the way that a 16-year-old white girl gets a year. How do you explain that? Well, I, I can't explain it, uh, you know, and, and like I say, if people wish to draw the conclusion uh, that it was uh, uh, racially motivated, they would be free to do that. Uh, the only thing I can say is that's just not the way it was. He got out of the automobile and went into the store. She did not. Uh, secondly, he had a handgun. Uh, she did not. We tried to base our decisions on the facts that we could prove in court. And I believe I did that in this case. Do you think that a juvenile who doesn't actually kill anybody should go into prison as a teenager and come out as a senior citizen? As you look at it uh, in, you know, some uh, 30 years later, perchance it was overly harsh. I wouldn't argue that. But I continue to be able to live with my decision on this case, right or wrong.
So we're on our way to the old Knox County Courthouse to meet with a juror in Almir's trial. This juror in particular said that we really wanted to talk to us. She said that she'd been thinking about this case for 25 years and have been feeling guilty for 25 years. I don't feel like what we did was just. That's disturbing. When the sentence was pronounced, uh, here again, I'm really naive. I, I thought the jury would have some input to that. Do you remember how you felt when you heard this 51-year minimum sentence? I was stunned, shocked. You know, a, a life was taken, and that is a terrible tragedy, um, a great injustice to the victim, to his family, how to all the people whose the ripples of his life would have gone out to for generations. But taking Almir's life, when he had just started it and wasn't even formed into who he was gonna become yet, really, I felt horrified. And I feel like I followed the instructions, but the law wasn't just. And um, I regret being a participant in that injustice. The juror asked us not to use her name because she's concerned about possible backlash for sharing her feelings about Almir's sentence. It was like a death blow. It was like overkill even. You know, it's just, it's cruel and unusual if you think about it. Definitely, if you're poor and black, you are doomed in a court system. It was definitely inhumane. And it was no justice done, no justice served. Nobody looked at him like he was nothing. And they knew he didn't deserve it, and they didn't care. They didn't care. Hello, this is a prepaid call from. I'm Rick. An inmate at the Tennessee Department of Corrections. Northwest Correctional Complex. Hello. Hey. I love him to death. Yes, I'm definitely a daddy's girl. What that picture with me and you when you was little when I had my arms around you? The center on the table. I like that picture. That's my first time you ever said daddy. My tough guy energy just went away that same day. <laughs> I was in love. I haven't really seen him in a while. And I'd love to just have him home, even if it, if it was just for a few hours, you know. Just let us go do something together, anything. What goes through your head when you think about the fact that your dad is serving a felony murder sentence and didn't murder anybody? It just makes me, like, realize that the system does not always work the right way. They know that I didn't shoot this person, this man, Joseph Bright. I like to say his name. I don't like to just say the person or the victim. I like to dignify the man by at least saying his name. But they know I didn't kill this man. A person can be charged with felony murder if they take part in a crime in which someone is killed, even if they didn't cause the death. The United States is one of only a few countries in the world with such a law. Felony murder doctrine in and of itself it is a fiction because it transfers the intent of a felony, which is not murder, and they shouldn't be treated like they intended to kill because they didn't. Through a series of rulings over the past 20 years, the Supreme Court has concluded that juveniles convicted of murder should be sentenced differently than adults. Nearly 12,000 people in the U.S. are serving life sentences for crimes they committed as a juvenile. Juveniles are different because they are sort of uniquely susceptible to peer pressures from outside. They have a greater capacity for change and growth over time. Their brain does not fully develop until they're 20, 21, between 21 and 25. So we know a lot more about brain development and if that juvenile is thinking like an adult or if they're thinking like a child. You don't really understand things. Like at that age of 16, you don't think life is like forever. You don't, you know, everything's right now, today, and next week. 
Since 1995, 236 juvenile offenders in Tennessee have received 51-year minimum sentences. 72% of them are black, compared to just 17% of the state's population. All of these factors, race, peer pressure, youthful decision-making, and a difficult childhood, played a role in Almir's case. I grew up in a, a drug-addicted home. My mother was on drugs. My father was absent. I spent a lot of time living with my grandmother. So I was really a kid. I had no big brothers. I had no father figure. So I wound up hanging with older guys and doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. And, and I was easily manipulated. You know, you blame yourself. You feel like you wasn't a good enough mom. But I did the best I could. What I lost, I never wanted a drug again in my life. It cost me too much. Can you talk to me a little bit about your family? I can. My mother's close. By God's will, she's straightened up her life, and she works, and she's got a nice place for herself, and I talk to her as often as I can. If you seen where I came from, I know I was a lost hope. People never thought I would amount to anything. I'm 20 years clean today. I'm living proof that people can change if given a chance. Just like I know I'm here, if given a chance, they would never have no more trouble out here at all, period. But people do change. That I know. I've never been able to take her anywhere but to a vending machine, you know? But we get along as much as we can in any way I can be, a support, a source of hope or something. So I get to tell them now that I'm in school and I'm doing something, they know it's not just sitting in here, you know, rattling cups off the bars like you would imagine. How does it feel when he says, like, I've never been able to treat her to something that's not in a vending machine? <laughs> it's really just heartbreaking because it's true. What have been the times that stick out in your mind where you've especially missed him? Around prom, birthdays. For the longest, I didn't want anything for my birthday, but for him to walk through the door. You know how, like, the little videos of the soldiers coming home? I always imagine, like, that'd be me, like, my dad getting out of prison and surprising me somewhere. <sighs> That's still a dream. <laughs> even now that I'm grown. People deserve a chance to make mistakes and learn from them and grow up. Yeah, he's definitely not the same person. He's a better man. There's no way he should still be there all these years later, and we all know he didn't kill anybody. Tim Hutchison was the sheriff when Almir Nance was convicted. I can understand the 51 years. He has no problem with him spending 51 years behind bars. So what are you going to do? Just say, oh, well, uh, he was 16 and had a weapon, but he doesn't need to do it just a couple of years because of his age. No, it's not that. It's the act. There are a lot of people who say there should not be felony murder charges because you shouldn't be considered a murderer if you didn't pull the trigger. Well, felony murder is a way to get these people off the street and keep them off the street. And they need to be off the street. And, and the same goes with Mr. Nance. He knew he was going inside the store to rob the store. What would your response be to people who say, this isn't really working, locking people up, doesn't actually uh, solve any problems? Well, for those who say it doesn't really solve any problems by locking these juveniles up um, for a long period of time, uh, Almir Nance hadn't been involved in any more violent crimes. Since the Supreme Court rulings, states around the country have been reconsidering life sentences for people like Almir. In 2021, a bill passed the Tennessee State Senate that would have reduced the mandatory sentence from 51 years to 25. There was opposition to it in the House, so the bill didn't move forward. State Senator John Lundberg voted against it. He's an influential voice in the legislature opposing criminal justice reform. These are heinous murders and acts. 
Um, and the unfortunate part, I think we have to admit, and we may not like it as a society, but there are some folks who are just born bad. And some of those people, probably best that you're behind bars. If it's their child, if it's someone in their community who is making these mistakes, uh, they don't believe that their child was born bad. It is only people from other communities, people with different backgrounds, people that they don't have a connection with, that they can sort of forget what they really know, which is that children are different. The Tennessee Supreme Court will be deciding soon if the state will treat children any differently. It's considering a case similar to Almir's, challenging the constitutionality of 51-year sentences for juveniles. The first time you were eligible for release is when? Uh, well, it's kind of non-existent. You know, at 16 years old, if you give a person 51 years, The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that mandatory life sentences for juveniles are cruel and unusual punishment, violating the Eighth Amendment. So I don't even look forward to that date. But Tennessee argues that 51 years is not a life sentence because eventually they could get out if they manage to live that long. I don't see anyone surviving a 51-year life sentence. I can't see it. Even if you didn't pull the trigger, even if you didn't know anything about it, felony murder, they're okay with you, with you dying in prison. We spoke with the family of Joseph Ridings, but they declined to take part in our story. His mother cited an old saying, if you have a sore place that is scabbed over, don't pick at it because it will bleed. I've been incarcerated for 26 years. Society may say throw those guys away, but I don't have to feel that way about myself, right? The family, they, you know, they never want to give up on you. For what time I have left, I choose to try to be the best version of myself that I can be. Hello. Hey, I'm here. We got everybody, we ain't got baby mirror. We yeah, all my I try to be as much a source of support or inspiration from a dark place. I try to shine light even from here, if I can, for them. I love y'all, man. I love you too, man. I miss y'all, man. Yeah. I love y'all. I wish you spirit, though. You know But you'll be coming you. home. You'll be coming home. You'll be coming out. Yeah, Lord willing. Yeah. I want my mom to see him. Come on. She talk about him all the time. You gonna have to come out there and get him a job. Yeah, no, that's my mom. She's uh, 87. Thank you so much. Yeah, love you, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait to see you, sweetie. Everybody loves I Amir, mean. even from where he is. Hey, we love you. Love you. Miss you. You on your way home. Yeah. Love you. Yes. Yeah. I've never given up hope, and I never will until he comes home. I ain't been long, you know, missing. That law is going to change very soon. OK. We need to take that drive, you know? We need to hit that highway, you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Go to the beach. And I feel and I know in my heart, and I believe that I will see our mirror get the chance to get in the car and ride with me play with his kids, spend time with his daughter. I'm staying out of trouble. I'm doing my best. I'm improving daily. I'm praying. I believe he's going to get a chance one day to come right in this door, and I'm going to be able to hug him and talk to him. I love you. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right.